Good morning, everyone. Jesus died for all the wrong reasons. That just does not sound right, does it? By the way, that's the way I look every morning. <laughs> you want to have a hint as to what I mean that Jesus died for all the wrong reasons? I'll give you one from Mark, although we'll come back to Mark in a future week. We're going to study John this morning. But Mark said in Mark chapter 15 and in verse 10, for he was aware that the chief priest, that is Pilate, had delivered him up because of envy. That's an example of a wrong reason why Jesus Christ died. And we're going to be looking at other reasons as to why he died. Now, when we look at these other reasons, I want you to look at them very carefully, closely, and as yourself, because I want you to ask yourself if you know more about these sins than you should. Get your Bibles and turn to John chapter 18. We're going to read verses 28 through chapter 19 and verse 6, and then we will come back and make three observations. John 18, 28 through verses 19 and verse 16. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They did not enter the headquarters themselves, otherwise they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. How thoughtful of these people. That was sarcasm, in case you didn't know. So Pilate came out to meet them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man weren't a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. Notice how they are being evasive. Pilate told them, you take him and judge him according to your law. It's not legal for us to put anyone to death, the Jews declared. They said this so that Jesus' words might be fulfilled, indicating what kind of death he was going to die. Then Pilate went back into the headquarters, summoned Jesus, and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you asking this on your own, or have others told you about me? I'm not a Jew, am I? Pilate replied. Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. You say that I'm a king, Jesus replied. I was born for this, and I have come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is truth, said Pilate. After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no grounds for charging him. You have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted back, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers also twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and clothed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and were slapping him in the face. Pilate went outside again and said to him, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know I find no grounds for charging him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the temple servants saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate responded, Take him and crucify him yourself, since I find no grounds for charging him. We have a law, the Jews replied to him, and according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was more afraid than ever. Think about it. Pilate had no problem believing in multiple gods. So he is probably thinking he might be truly a god. He went back to the headquarters and asked Jesus, where are you from? Jesus did not give him an answer. So Pilate said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? 
Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? You would have no authority over me at all, Jesus answered him. That hadn't been given to you from above. This is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. From that moment, Pilate kept trying to release him, but the Jews shouted, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Anyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside. He sat down on the judge's seat in a place called the Stone Pavement, the Aramaic, Gabbatha. It was a preparation day for the Passover, and it was about noon that he told the Jews, Here is your king. They shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Pilate said, Should I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Then he handed him over to be crucified. We learn these three reasons why Jesus died. Jesus was a blasphemer, so the Jews claimed. They did this so they could keep their religious power. John chapter 19, verses 6 to 11. Jesus was a scapegoat, so the Romans could keep their Pax Romana, Roman peace, a violent peace. John chapter 19, verses 12 through 13. And Jesus was a traitor, so the Jews gave false allegiance to a government to keep their societal presence. John chapter 19, 14 through 16. These are wrong reasons why Jesus died. He was not a blasphemer. He never should have been a scapegoat. He definitely was not a traitor. But we show that these people were willing to do the thing that they hated the most, give allegiance to Caesar. And therefore Jesus died for the wrong reasons. What's your one takeaway point? Don't get excited, I'm not almost done. <laughs> Most of the lesson today is going to be application and assignment. Thought I'd better temper that joy that was bubbling up in all of you. Jesus died for the sins of the world by the hand of the sinners committing sin against him. Because he died for all the wrong reasons. What's your application and assignment? I was listening to somebody preach recently, and they made an excellent point. They said, I can preach the sermon, but I cannot do the application for you. So Jesus died for all the right reasons, too. And we're going to cover those later, some of them. But he also died for all the wrong ones. What you and I cannot do, should not do, is just look at their past sins and point the fingers at them and say, well, I can't believe them. What have we made Jesus into today? You see, they made Jesus into a blasphemer. They made Jesus into a scapegoat. They made Jesus into a traitor. Everybody get that? So what have we made Jesus into today? Are we guilty of blasphemy? You see, have we changed Jesus so that we don't serve like he did? He served his father. He served everyone, his disciples. He served those that were even crucifying him. So do we serve people? For example, do we serve people our forgiveness? Or do we hold it back? Do we serve people our submission? Or do we try to pull rank? Do we serve an Americanized Christianity of right and might? Have we, for example, re-crucified Jesus making self our own God, a mini-God, a demigod? If we have done this, we are blasphemers. Amen? You had a hard one with that one, didn't you? So we'll try it again. If we make ourselves God, if we serve self more than God, then we are blasphemers. Amen? Amen. 
I know it's a little bit different angle than you're used to. Are we our own scapegoat? Have we changed Jesus to, to fit into our world so that we can experience a false <clears throat> peace? They had the Pax Romana, which was a violently enforced peace. We all want peace, but at what cost? I think everybody would agree that our world is vastly changing and quickly changing, where peace will actually be found in us, quote, holding our peace. But as this gentleman named Menachem Mendel of Colt said, peace without truth is a false peace. So if we become our own scapegoat so that we can have peace, it's actually a false peace or a pseudo peace. Al Mohler said there are three stages of a moral revolution, and we can add an immoral revolution. I want you to pay close attention to these three stages because we're seeing them in our lifetime. What was condemned is now celebrated. What was celebrated is now condemned. And those refusing to celebrate are condemned. Three stages. I sent as my Saturday special a short little article on defending marriage. And I sent it to various Bible groups. And two of these Bible groups rejected it because they said it was disrespectful. What I did was I helped upheld the biblical message of marriage. And that's considered disrespectful. Robert Gorge from Princeton wrote an article called Ashamed of the Gospel. The days of socially acceptable Christianity in the West are surely over. The days of comfortable Christian orthodoxy are past. Now, if one does not believe what the church teaches, or for now at least, even if one does believe those teachings, but is prepared to be completely silent about them, one is safe. One can still be a comfortable Christian. In other words, a tame Christian, a Christian who is ashamed of the gospel or who is willing to act publicly as if he is or she were ashamed. That one is still socially acceptable. But a Christian who makes it clear that he or she is not ashamed must be prepared to take risks and make sacrifices. In other words, false peace or spiritual warfare. Francis George said, and you can see this, there were three stages in the moral, immoral evolution, revolution. He said, I expect to die in my bed. My successor will die in prison. And his successor will die a martyr in the public square. This is our future. Searching for pseudo peace, we can escape this. We have to prepare ourselves, we have to prepare our children so they can prepare their children. You know, I understand that the Bible does teach there is a peace that, as the old King James says, passeth all understanding, Philippians 4, 6. That's because that peace does not come from giving in to the pressures from all around. If we are satisfied with a pseudo peace, a false peace, that comes from us forcing our peace on others or them forcing their peace on us. Are we false conquerors? Are we conquered by the false peace police? Are we traitors? 
Who is our king? Self, state, safety. Have we changed Jesus so he actually is no longer king? Not in reality. Have we lost the balance between giving to Caesar what is Caesar's and giving to God what is God's? Understanding that Jesus said, look at the image, but then he is making the point we are the image of God. We are to give ourselves to God. What would our walk with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit look like if we were not Americans? Is American Christianity pure Christianity? Nowadays you, you hear people say, well, you know, the, the good old days of moral America. Okay, there, there's been times when certain sins were... <clears throat> Not celebrated, but I'll tell you what, other sins were, weren't they? Look at the history where white Christians disowned non-white Christians as brothers and sisters in full fellowship and equality. Look now where political disagreements can be more important to some than spiritual agreements. Have we supplanted Jesus by making America or self, state, or safety king? If we are, we are usurpers. Amen? Amen? Well, I already broke the way that I do this lesson. So we're going to have a second takeaway point. And that is, you and I constantly, and we've been studying this on Wednesday, and 1 Corinthians is one of the most fitting studies right now because it's, it's about culture in Corinth. Has our culture changed us instead of us changing our culture and the culture within us? We all have to admit that, that Christian influence is waning. And it might be past the point, the tipping point, where we as Christians can have a positive effect on our society. Modern history is showing hostility, disdain. And hatred. Too often, people, we are like the Jewish leaders, where we put self like the Romans' powers, where we're looking for peace, when we are falsely thinking we are the Pentecost crowd. So, did Jesus die for the wrong reason for us? This would be a really bummer of a lesson if I stopped there. But I think, hopefully, an important lesson. Jesus did die for all the wrong reasons, but get your Bibles out. We're going to go through John and just discover 10 reasons why Jesus died that are positive. And in doing this, we'll be answering the question, where's the gospel? John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We know lambs took away sin by sacrifice. Chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. So the Jews replied to him, What sign will you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Therefore, the Jews said, this temple took 46 years to build, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. So Jesus died as a lamb to take away the sin of the world. Jesus died as a sign from God. 
chapter 3, verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus' ascension and his descending can have two meanings. One, where his descending into the grave and ascending in resurrection, or two, descending into incarnation and ascending to the throne. But either one and both of them are part of the reason why Jesus died. Chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. Just as Moses was lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So Jesus died to save the world through him. Give us eternal life. But that one's very much similar, but I just... I'm fascinated with this next one, so I included it also. Chapter 4, verse 42. This is the scene of Jesus, the Samaritan woman. She goes and she tells everybody in her, her village what she has, has discovered. And in verse 42, the Samaritans, remember, these are Samaritans. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that this, the Samaritans are saying, this really is a savior of the world. And I love that because the Samaritans were separated from the Jews, but they saw Jesus as the savior of both. And not only both, but all who will be saved. Chapter 6, verse 51. We find that Jesus was crucified to be the living bread that fulfills and gives life. Life is such an important theme in the Gospel of John. In chapter 6 and verse 51, he says, I am the living bread. Contrast to the manna that fell in the wilderness. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Look at chapter 8 and verse 28. So Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. Now some of your versions have the word he there. The word he is not in the Greek. But many people believe in their translations that it should be supplied. Uh, the Christian Standard Bible does. I think John often uses the phrase, I am, and translators miss the point. We know it's very clear in John chapter 8 and verse 58, Jesus said to him, or said to them, truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. But I want to suggest to you that I think that he is saying this too. That in his crucifixion, which would involve not just his death, but his resurrection, his glorification by his Father, is also an identity of who he is. He is God incarnate. The New American Standard, the 2020 version, differs from the 95 and 77. It says this, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. In the sense, I exist, is the way that they are doing it, and do nothing on my own. But I say these things as the Father instructed me. Another translation, the literal standard version, believes that Jesus is claiming deity here. Jesus therefore said to them, when you may lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And I do nothing of myself, but according as my Father taught me, these things I speak. Now turn to... Chapter 9, verse 39. Chapter 9 and 39. We hear so often nowadays, judge not, lest ye be judged, but let's look died on the cross. In John chapter 9 and verse 39, he says, I came into this world for judgment in order that those who do not see will see. And those who do see will become blind. Him coming into the world was not just a birth, 
It involved his life, his teaching, his glorifying his father, being called a blasphemer, being made a scapegoat, and being traded for a false king. Jesus died to judge the world. Chapter 12, verse 31. Jesus died to cause a cosmic defeat. Well, this new Bible is giving me trouble. Chapter 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. You look at verse 32. As for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to me. He said this to indicate what kind of death he was about to die. So he was crucified to defeat the devil. And finally, the one we're going to look at, these are just 10 that are within the book of John. There are more. Chapter 13 and verse 18. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know those I have chosen. But the scripture must be fulfilled. The one who eats my bread has raised his heel against me. Very fitting, that passage, considering Jesus had just washed the heel of the one who betrayed him. The reason that list, and it's a very short list, is important is it reveals that Jesus' death, it's more than just about me. It's more than just about me being forgiven of my sins, given another chance, or eternity in heaven. The scheme, people, is bigger than me. But the false reasons why he died all focused on what? Me. In the sense of the Romans and the Jews. And all of them were guilty of the same. You see, after going over those ten reasons why Jesus Christ died, right reasons why Jesus Christ died, we can see that the scheme of redemption is, is about heaven, it's about earth, and it's about hell. One more point about where's the gospel. Those wrong reasons Jesus died, those calling Jesus a blasphemer, using him as a scapegoat, and calling him a traitor, Jesus died for those people too. Amen? Amen. If Jesus can die for those sinners, then there is no sin that I can admit that can make me too far gone to be saved. Jesus died for me too. And that's a right reason when I accept. If you need to respond to the right reasons why Jesus died, maybe looking at the false reasons in your own life, that might have been attributed to you. We invite you to come now while we stand and sing.